The following broadcast is released under a Creative Commons license. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. I believe He lived and died, and that He rose again. I believe and trust in Him. Ascended into hell, Christ our living head will one day come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe and trust in Him. I will trust in my Redeemer, sing of His love. That lasts forever Know His full and sure salvation I will trust in Him Though the world falls around me I rest and know that He has found me Christ the rock is my Welcome all to Pastor Yeshua. You've been listening to Creed by Richard Jensen from his album, Order of Service. By way of introduction, Pastor is an acrostic which stands for Preaching All Salvation Through One Redeemer. Our Redeemer, Yeshua, Jesus, is the Hebrew name for the Lord. It means Yahweh, the Lord, is salvation. Translated from Hebrew into the Greek language, the name Yeshua becomes Jesus. The English transliteration for Jesus is Jesus. This program deals with apologetics, questions on and about God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. I take questions and seek by Scripture to give answers and encouragement for everyone, including the tough-minded living in today's skeptical society. And now, let's join Pastor Yeshua. Welcome to Pastor Yeshua. As stated in an earlier episode discussing types and shadows, when we study all of Scripture, we tend to see that indeed God seems to create all things according to a pattern which testifies of Him. As we continue to look and study the visible and invisible things of creation, we are able to increasingly see God's reflection to some degree in that mirror. When these examples occur within Scripture, we characteristically refer to them as types or shadows. We shall also see that ultimately, as with all Scripture, that these types and shadows point to the substance, which is Jesus. In this episode, we continue our study of types and shadows with the story of Joseph and his brothers. Father, we thank you that you have chosen the vehicle of your word, the Bible, inspired by your Spirit to declare the beauty, majesty, and truth of your nature and character and of your relationship to man. We thank you that in and through your word you reveal the love, mercy, and forgiveness of your blessed Son, Yeshua the Christ. We thank and praise you as we once again enjoy the privilege of having communion with you through your word, which is made alive through the power of your Spirit implanted in our hearts by faith. In Jesus' name, Amen. The story of Joseph and his brethren is a classic tale which is well recognized as being a classic type of Jesus and his ministry. Though most have heard some aspect of the typology, a study of this type would be incomplete without including it. The story for this episode begins in chapter 30 of Genesis. In verse 1, we learn that Rachel is barren. In verse 22, God remembers Rachel, opens her womb, at which point Rachel gives birth to Joseph. So from the start, 
Rachel's inability to bear children without the direct intervention of God mirrors the substance of Mary with the virgin birth of Jesus also at the direct intervention of God. Moving forward, the next thing which we notice is that Joseph was the most favored and beloved son of Jacob. Genesis chapter 37 verse 3 states, quote, Now Israel, Jacob's new name given to him by God in chapter 35 verse 10, loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors. The first thing we learn from this is that Joseph is the type of Jesus, the son of God. Jacob is the earthly type in our story of God the Father. Jacob had twelve sons, but Joseph was his beloved son of promise. Jacob worked fourteen years for Laban to earn his right to marry Rachel. Likewise, even though Jacob had several sons who preceded Joseph, Joseph was the first son of his first love, Rachel. Consequently, Jacob had a special place in his heart for Joseph. Because Jacob favored Joseph, he made Joseph a coat of many colors. The fact that Jacob had twelve sons in this story is the type for the substance, which is that of the house of Israel, God's chosen people. His children are comprised of twelve tribes descended from these same twelve brothers. The fact that Joseph was one of the twelve mirrors the truth that Jesus was also descended from among his brethren, the house of Israel. The statement that Joseph had a special place in his father's Jacob's heart complements the reality that Jesus has a special place in the heart of God the Father. For example, Jesus is said by God the Father in Matthew chapter 3 verse 17 and also chapter 17 verse 5 as well as Mark chapter 9 verse 7, Luke chapter 9 verse 35 and 2 Peter verse 1 verse 17 as being his quote, beloved son unquote, in whom God is well pleased. Like Jacob, it is God the Father who glorifies the Son, and not the Son who glorifies himself. Like Joseph, who was given a coat of many colors, Jesus is crowned with the glory given to him by God the Father from all eternity. It is interesting that commenting the Aramaic Targums say regarding verse 3 that, quote, now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because Joseph's features were like his own features and he made him an embroidered cloak, unquote. This is a very insightful comment because it demonstrates that as opposed to the idea that Israel arbitrarily loved Joseph more than his other children, there is a deeper theological substance given, namely, Joseph bore characteristics were, which were like that of his father. This testifies to the substance, Jesus, who also bore the same characteristics and nature of God the Father, according to Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, quote, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, unquote. Or again, John chapter 14, verse 9, quote, Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Unquote. The cloak or coat of many colors is an earthly type of the manifold characteristics and roles found of Jesus and of the Godhead. Throughout the Old and New Testaments, Scripture uses the type of color to speak of various attributes and virtues of Jesus Christ. By way of survey throughout the Bible, we can gather the following analogies of colors as the types which speak of Jesus Christ. For example, scarlet or red equals Christ's blood, atonement, forgiveness, healing and deliverance. Amber speaks of the glory of God. Black refers to sin, death, and famine. 
Blue represents the sky, heaven, hope, grace, or peace. Crimson, scarlet, or red are the same as blood, symbolizing atonement and sacrifice. Gold and white are purity, divinity, victory, and worthiness. Purple equals royalty, majesty, and kingship. Green refers to new life, prosperity, and growth. Orange speaks of intimacy, boldness, courage, praise, and spiritual warfare. And finally, yellow equals joy. While we are not told what colors compromised the coat Joseph wore, we are told that they were quote-unquote many. As with Joseph, so much more it is with Jesus. Every king wears a royal robe with manifold colors and designs and consisting of precious materials to signify their majesty and authority. Likewise, the colors which represent Jesus are incomparable, indescribable, and without number. Only the king may wear this robe. Whether we are discussing Jesus the man, or Jesus who is divinely God of very God, the most beautiful colors of the rainbow fall short of the glory which is found in Christ Jesus. It is only Jesus Christ who is worthy to wear and the glory given to him by the Father, which is here represented by the coat of many colors. Genesis chapter 37 verse 4 says, quote, And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. Unquote. It must be remembered that Jesus was a man, born of a woman, i.e. Mary, and descended from Jewish heritage from Abraham and in turn from Adam and Eve. Jesus had a singular purpose as Messiah to save his people. This applies firstly to the seed of Abraham and to the house of Israel. More broadly, salvation is to those who are the seed of Abraham by faith, which includes not only the Jews, but to all who are justified by faith, as was Abraham, who is said to be the father of faith. Verse 4 observes that Joseph's brethren were resentful and hostile towards Joseph, partly because Jacob favored Joseph. This was also the case with Jesus. Because Jesus was of Jewish origin, it follows that Jesus' brethren were Jewish people. When Jesus began his ministry, his brethren had two choices. Believe that Jesus was the Messiah and receive salvation and repentance by faith, or reject Jesus and his claims. Unfortunately, many of Jesus' brethren were hostile to Jesus, hated him, and sought to kill him the same way as their predecessors sought to kill Joseph. With Joseph, his brethren gradually came to dislike him more and more as he grew in favor with both God and Jacob. With Jesus, the gospel accounts clearly paint the picture that the animosity of the Jewish people with political affiliation and religious establishment grew increasingly angry with Jesus' claims as well as his popularity with some. In this respect, the parity between Jesus and Joseph cannot be missed. Verse 7 states, For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright, and behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. Unquote. In verse 7, Joseph reveals to his brethren the dream which God gives him. In this dream, Joseph sees himself as a sheaf of grain. Additionally, the setting of the dream is the harvest and binding of barley in the field. As Joseph's sheaf is bound, it rises, taking prominence, while the surrounding sheaves bow to Joseph's sheaf. While Joseph's dream eventually unfolds to his family, the type of this dream does not begin to take more substance until we read Leviticus chapter 23, verse 10 through 12. Quote, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye be come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, 
Then shall ye bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath the priest shall wave it. And ye shall offer that day when ye wave the sheaf a he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. Unquote. Leviticus chapter 23 verses 10 through 12 outlines an ancient agricultural ceremony held annually which would later be referred to as first fruits. By tradition, before any grain could be harvested or eaten, a sheaf of grain would be cut out from the overall field of harvest and brought to the priest. The priest would then take the sheaf and wave it before God as an offering for all the fruits of grain which were yet to be harvested. This particular type in Leviticus is later discussed in its fulfillment beginning in Acts chapter 26 verse 23. Quote, that Christ should suffer, and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead, and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. Unquote. The topic resumes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. Quote, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Unquote. And also in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 18, quote, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence." Unquote. It must be emphasized that this ceremony called the wave offering, or the first fruits, is the beginning of a larger observance concluding 15 days later referred to as the Feast of Pentecost. The harvest of Pentecost must be preceded by the wave offering of the sheaf. The order of the type foreshadows the order of the substance. Jesus himself gives us greater focus and understanding on the substance in his parable in John chapter 12, verses 23 and 24. Quote, and Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit." Unquote. Thus, Jesus clearly identifies himself as the substance of the sheaf, who is the wave offering. Jesus recognizes that he must willingly die via the crucifixion in order that he, like the grain, fall to the ground, i.e. die. Jesus also knows that he will by his own power rise again, i.e. resurrect. Jesus' resurrection, his triumph over sin, death, hell, and the grave, provides the method and power to bring forth much fruit, identified as all those who are buried along with him by confession of faith, to be raised again by the same power. This harvest, 50 days later, we recognize as Pentecost. Pentecost, as you will recall, was the event detailed in the book of Acts, which officially signaled the beginning of the church with the outpouring of God's Spirit on that occasion. The end result is that Joseph sees himself as a sheaf in verse 7 with the dream which God gives him. Thus, Joseph identifies himself with the imagery of the sheaf of the harvest, with the remaining sheaves, his brethren, seen worshipping him. The substance here is clearly Jesus as the fulfillment of the beginning of the harvest of grain, which is the church. We know that Jesus, like the wave offering, will be offered to God as an acceptable offering for the harvest, i.e. the church, which was to come. 
end time, all men, like Joseph's brethren, will do obeisance to Jesus as they did to Joseph in his dream. Romans chapter 14, verse 11 says, quote, For as it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God, unquote. Philippians chapter 2, verse 10 says, quote, That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, unquote. Genesis chapter 37, verse 13 states, quote, And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not they, brethren, feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will show thee unto them. And he said unto him, Here am I, unquote. Here in verse 13, we see Israel, who is the type of God the Father, sending Joseph, the type of his son Jesus, to his brothers, who are the literal heads of the tribes, who along with Joseph represent the entire body of the Jewish people. In this case, his brothers, who are the head of each tribe, are supposed to be engaged in the feeding, the spiritual welfare of the sheep, who are the type of God's people at large. We are reminded that Jesus was first sent to seek and save the lost, beginning with the house of Israel. In this respect, Jesus, as did all his disciples, had a healthy respect and principle for the descendants of Israel, who they frequently referred to as their brethren. This draws a direct analogy between the situation and circumstances of both Joseph and Jesus. Verse 14, quote, And he said to him, Go, I pray thee, see whether it be well with thy brethren, and with well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem, unquote. Verse 14 expounds on verse 13, giving further insight. Joseph's mission given to him by his father is to be an, his ambassador to his brethren. Joseph is a mediator between his brethren, who are seen here in the field, i.e. the world, tending the sheep, i.e. God's people, and Israel, the type of God who is seen at home in his tent, i.e. heaven. Joseph, like Jesus, receives his commission and is sent by his father as his dear son, clothed with a coat of many colors to signify and testify of his nature and relationship to his father, i.e. God. Jesus never sought to glorify himself, but was instead glorified by his Father, who worked in and through him, for all who had eyes to see and ears to hear. This verse reminds us of the parable which Jesus himself gave as told in Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 through 39, which says, quote, Hear another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard, and hedged it round about, and digged a winepress in it, and built a tower, and let it out to husbandmen, and went into a far country. And when the time of the f fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen, that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants, and beat one, and killed another, and stoned another. Again he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir, come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him, and cast him out of the vineyard, and slew him." Unquote. Lastly, it is interesting to note in verse 14 the root Hebrew words behind the word veil as well as the proper names Hebram and Shechem. The Hebrew word veil carries the idea of something deep or depth. The proper name Hebron means to, quote, unite, join, bind together, be joined, or be coupled, unquote. 
The proper name Shechem means, quote, to rise early or, quote, to make an early start, unquote. Thus, in our type, we see Israel, i.e. God the Father, sending Joseph, i.e. Jesus, God the Son, out from, quote, the depth, unquote, of the triune Godhead, i.e. something united and joined in unison. And he, i.e. Jesus, came from the beginning as the Alpha and the Omega, i.e. the idea of an early start. If we fully pay attention, the stage is set, the players are identified, and as the type unfolds, we should have no doubt that the substance will continue to unfold, giving us yet another glimpse of what God continues to repeat again and again. This story, like so many others, stands as an example to declare God's redemptive plan made before the world began, so that all who read would know and understand the depth of His love for those who are His. This concludes this episode. Please join me again for part two. Now, if you have any questions about God, the Bible, or the Christian faith, I encourage you to send me an email at pastor underscore Yeshua at yahoo.com. That's P-A-S-T-O-R underscore Y-E-S-H-U-A at yahoo.com. Thank you for listening. Trust in